Welcome back, friends. This is the Tell It Like It Is podcast. I'm very blessed to have my mom here. This is part two. Um, we just had a great talk. I think that was a good backstory. Um, I like the early days of, you know, Portland. And I think yours, I mean, it's, it's my mom, so I think it's interesting. And... You know, I'm Jamaican, and most people look at me and they, they, they say, oh, I couldn't tell. You know, I think the assumption is Jamaicans talk a certain way, and I don't talk that way, so they just assume I'm African-American from the States. Um, but um, even in Jamaica, I was just very interested in, in knowing all there was to know, and... Um, I, I was asking you questions back then, and I continue to ask questions because my, my mindset is putting things in context. And when I came to America, for me, I wanted to, for me, I saw my ancestors as the same ancestors of African American. So to me, although I was born in Jamaica, I didn't see myself different from African American other than the fact that I was born in Jamaica and they lived in America. So little by little, more and more, I saw the trauma and my experiences um, as congruent, the same as their experiences. And I made parallels. And you know, the thing that I always come back to is seeing the lineage of trauma from the 50s, the 30s, up to now. And to see how a lot of black people don't have strong, deep-rooted families. Um, so they, they make the same generational mistakes, you know, of single parentship, not having the, the nuclear family. Like this thing is kind of like a repetitive cycle happening to us. And we, because we don't have strong family ties, we don't understand the great grandmother, the grandmother, the mother, we just think life is hard and it just happens and it was like an accident or something that it happened to us. And that's why the minute, the minute, uh, you know, Darlene got pregnant, I was like, I want to get married, I want a nuclear family, I want to break that generational curse, not just for me and my family, but I want us to heal. And I feel, I feel just as passionate, if not more, because the more I understand, the more that I see the bigger picture, I'm like, wait a minute, something's happening here. And I don't want to contribute to the problem. I want to be a part of the healing. And that's what we're doing here. Understanding trauma, understanding what we're missing so that we can move forward and make changes and not replicate the traumas that were belongs to us. Okay. So one of the things you have to realize is that in Jamaica there's a plantation system and in the Caribbean, in the West Indies, the black people came from Africa where they were dragged from their homelands, where they were king where they were princesses and princes and dragged as slaves on slave ship to Jamaica and to other parts of the Caribbean. What that meant was, as a slave, he had no talk. So when the slaves got to Jamaica, the, the men, if when they were captured, let's say a man and a woman were captured, when they got to Jamaica and the other Caribbean islands, they were sent to different plantation, and they were separated from their wives or from their husbands. And those wives never saw their husbands again, or husbands here, wives again and so those husbands start new family it was a plantation system where men and women were separated you were slaves and some of the things that we inherited from the plantation and slavery was that men did not see their role did not truly um participate in the role that they should participate in in other words Many Jamaican men, they would father children and they would see themselves as, the, see the children as their children, but they don't see the responsibility. 
That's one of the things I admire about you, in that when your wife has the kids, you're saying, we are having the kids. Not my wife having the kids, but we are having the kids. We gave birth. So majority of the men in Jamaica, then and now, uh, because so many Jamaican men have not married to the woman that they have children with. So that brings problems, that brings separation. So you'll find um, children in one, one woman having, as I said before, with my example, my mom had three children with three different men. And that was in the 50s, mark you, and early 60s, and it's still happening now. I remember as an educator, I had a class, and we we're talking about families, and I, well, my student, my adult student said to me, um, she was gonna have two children for the same man, and I was taken aback, and I asked why. And her response was, when one of the fathers don't have money, when I had the children, what she said, when she had the children with the same man, and that same man does not have the money where to for her, where would she get so get money from? So she would so she would have children with two men or different men, so that one excuse me, one doesn't have money today, the other one would have. And that blew my mind because that was far from my thinking as an educator. But if we get back to the old matter of slavery and so on, it was part of the culture that women were living and seeing fathers, men, father, children, different women, and it was part of the culture. So when I got pregnant with you, I did not want to be a part of that culture. I, I, I did not want to be a part of that culture. And even before that happened, um, I wanted to have a nuclear family myself. But it's, for me, unlike some people like to tell it all, I don't like to tell it all in public domain. So that was not the case with your dad and I. So when we got married, we never got married together because I didn't want that. Because prior to that, me getting pregnant with you, I'd asked him several times if we could get married, and he'd said no. So knowing, upon knowing that I was pregnant, I didn't want to get married, I refused because I didn't want to be patronized. And, and it was from then I decided that, hey, I would have one child, one child only, because I didn't want to perpetuate the story where you're having children for different men. And so you have to look at that scenario, where we are in the Caribbean, where we are in Jamaica. And as I pointed out, it's not a story about Jamaica, it's a story in the Caribbean, where men were father children. So if today, you're gonna hear people in Jamaica speak about their baby mothers, our women talk about their baby father, and they have never one day thought of your father as my baby father. I, I knew he was your dad, and I called him by his name, but I never said, that's my baby father, because I, I didn't see myself in that shoes. I didn't want to be in that shoes. As an educator, I wanted something more. And that's one of the reasons I grew you the way I did. And that's the reason you spoke the way um, you do. Because um, you don't speak role and patois in Jamaica, what I try to do. Notice, try to do is speak Jamaican standard English. That's one of the reasons people say to you, you don't sound like a Jamaican. Because when we, when you were born, you're born at home, where we try to speak the Jamaican English instead of focusing on Creole or focusing on Patois, which is a local thing. So each family, each person, has to decide on what they want. And as a young person myself, when I was 18, and then I left for college, I pictured a life for myself, where I wanted to be. I didn't want to have children out of wedlock. As a matter of fact, I didn't even want to have children. 
But if you had children, you want to have amount of wedlock. And so you're like a young person, we get carried away and things happen. I got pregnant and knew what I was doing. But I said, hey, that is it. The father decided to go start another family elsewhere. I said, okay, well, fine. I can understand that. And I started another family with someone who I love and I've been living for 30 odd years now with. I'm very happy. But I decided that I didn't want to have a second child who would have a second name. As a matter of fact, at one point I was even saying if I were to have gotten pregnant, I would give the same last name to that child. Fortunately, I didn't have another child, so um, I didn't have to do that. So I'm saying that to say uh, the culture in which you live influences the way of life. And although the culture is changing, many things are not changing. And depending on the focus that each person has for himself, but as an educator, as someone who has gone to postgraduate level, and I've taught psychology for the past 15 years. Uh, you have to look at the role a culture plays and the society in which that culture is made. So the Jamaican culture, the New York culture, the Dominican Republic culture. So children growing up in New York children growing up in Barbados, children growing up in Jamaica, they are heavily influenced by the culture. So when you have a culture where the norm is for men to impregnate three or four women and call them their baby mothers, and where they don't have that responsibility, where they, in Jamaica you have a lot of what is known as a visiting relationship. So the man visits, they cohabitate, I mean, they, they have coitus, according to Shell, um, yeah, whatever. So they have sexual relationship for that night, and then they leave the next morning, or they leave in the middle of the night, and they go back to their homes. Many of that kind of relationship are still going on in Jamaica. Another type is also going on as well, is where you have men who say, all right, they say they fall in love with someone and something happened, their father, two or even three children, they live together with the woman and the three children for say five years and then something happened and they decided that they didn't want to share the home with that woman anymore. And that man would go on to start another family elsewhere or and the woman herself may start another family. But don't get me wrong, there are many women who are in that situation or who were in that situation who decided that hey you can't be bothered with men i'm going to raise my children by myself so there are many educated women in jamaica many children, many women who are wise and who have met men who would not honor them by getting married but getting married is not the end of all there are many cultures in the world where People do not go before a pastor or before a justice of the peace or a notary probably to get married. But what I'm saying, the point I want to bring home is this. There are many women and men in Jamaica who have fathered and mothered children and they have not start, they have not maintained a nuclear um, family and they have what is known as the extended family. So in Jamaica, you find children living with aunts, or children living with grandmother and grandfather, and so on. So there are much extended family in, in Jamaica. And when you were young, we had an excellent aunt who was our extended family, and she played a role in your life, and in my life. Aunt Lee, she died in 2019. And so, I think what I'm trying to say is that each person has to decide on the role and on the family and on the position he or she wants to take in life. And I think that education 
is an important factor in that role. So because I am an educated person, the decisions I make are influenced by that. And not only that though, my determination, my will, what do I want? Where do I see myself? Do I want to have two, three, four children for different men? Or do I want to have a child and continue with my education and continue with my own personal growth? So we have to look at culture is very influential and very strong in who we are today. And if, if you suffer trauma, I'm truly sorry. But in this world, we have to either make it or you break it. So you have made it. And I'm very extremely proud of your progress in life and how you're raising your kids and the role that you're playing. So each person has to decide the role he or she wants to play. We're all players, by the way. Um, one of the things that come to, come to mind is you're very proper. You're very proper. I do not know what that means. That, that, mean, <laughs> that means that, like you said, there was a very strong emphasis on speaking properly. You know, you have this sense, this self-respect, you know, you're not in the dance halls, you were very, like, you know, clean cut, and I need to be in church, and you, you have this thing to yourself. No? Yes? Um, what, you, what I want to make clear is this. If you're going to make it in the world, especially if you're from a poor background, I was from a poor background. My grandmother was was a, a person who sold um, hardware and, and stuff, haberdashery in the market to provide for us, for myself and my two sisters. And um, if you're going to make it in the world, I realized very quickly that you need to speak the language of the books. So the books that we use in Jamaica then and now were not written in Creole or in Patwa. They were written in standard English. And so if you were going to make it in the world, you needed to speak the language of the book. And that's what I tried to speak. The language of books. So that I can stand in front of anyone and answer a question or ask a question and I'm understood. So if I were to have gone to England, if I were to have gone to Canada, as so I speak English, and when I spoke, you should be able to, answer, to understand what I'm saying, or to make that point clear. So that's why I speak the way I do, and that's why we try to grow up in such a way that you speak the language of the books, right? And in relation to your, and I trust a question about church, God plays a significant part in my life. I do not think I could be here if it were not for God and his grace and his mercy. So I'm a strong believer in God. I'm a, I'm a Christian in word and in deed. I believe in Christ. I believe he's coming back. And I should be prepared for when he comes back. And because I'm a Christian, most of what I do is influenced by the Christian religion. So the dance hall and alcohol and those things are not part of my experience. Did I, ans did I answer your question? Yeah, I don't want to keep you very long. I know we're on vacation and um, I'm very happy that we got to do a, a little bit of this face to face. And I think, you know, there's a little bit of this that I wanted to just be on the record of history and speak to my foundation and the foundation that came before me, you know, because I heard a lot about it, but I think there's something about the old way of living, you know, like you said, Grandma, going to the market on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and to sell her stuff. You never went on Sunday. Markets were never open on Sunday. 
So it's just so the market was open to go to market Friday, Fridays and Saturdays to sell the things, sell things like underwear, shorts, handkerchiefs, those things that you get to buy in places like Walmart. Right. So she'll go to the city of Kingston, she'll buy mm -hmm. from there, and then she'll go to Port Antonio Market where she sells those things. And that's what fed us. We were never hungry. Uh, we never wore torn clothes. So for me, for example, when I see young people today in torn jeans, it's so, mm, take me back. Because we never wore tor torn clothes. We would never wore torn clothes either. So religion plays an important part in my life. On my upbringing, my grandmother read the Bible. She taught us to read the Bible. We would read the Bible to her, not because she couldn't read. But you know, an interesting um, thing about my grandmother that I'd like to highlight. She told us that very early, when she when she grew up, she grew up with an aunt. And that aunt only allowed her to go to school for a half day. In those days, school started at nine in the morning and ended at four. We broke for lunch at 12 and we resume at one. And my grandmother told us that she would only go to school for a half day each time. But my grandmother was very smart and she read it. And so although she didn't go to school for the full day, you know, as she grew up before she got to 15, um, she was very smart. She was an entrepreneur and you couldn't um, trick her and so forth. She was a very wise woman and she knew how to spend money, she knew how to save, and she knew how to save so that she could provide a home for my two sisters and I and my cousin. So I'm saying that to say, even though there are some people who did not get the university education, they were smart in what mm -hmm. they do and they were educated. So she got married pretty early and she, as I said before, she got married and then she had children for that one man. All of them were for that one man. And that's, she was not the exception, but she was among the few who had that experience. I remember Granny. Yes, we, we all affectionately called her Granny. And I remember there was this old record player there. Yeah, she had her record player, she had her radio. So we were in, we used to listen to a station called Bone Air. So and they still have the station now. So I'm saying that our family is important and depending on the family you find yourself in, you can either make it or break it. Because there were people from Mount Pleasant where I grew up. Well not reach where I reached and we went to the same school. And so it has to be, it has to do with the individual. Right. Your goal in life, how do you see yourself? Where do you want to be? So we have trauma. And Alexis, you speak about trauma. I experienced trauma. My mom died at, when I was six years old. Whose mom died when you were six? So between 15 and 21, she died. She left four kids behind. And I am the first of the four. That was traumatic for me. But even though it was traumatic, I had a sure foundation for my grandmother. She provided a home for us. And from my grandmother, I went to live with one of my aunt. And my foundation continued. So we all dealt with trauma. And it is the will in us that helps us to deal with that trauma. To say, am I going to remain in trauma experience or am I going to shine forth so that the trauma does not become me? The trauma is left behind. All right, so Freud speaks about the head, the ego, the super ego. And those are very important things. Are we going to be led by the head or are we going to say, hey, I want to be not just seeking pleasure, but I want to make sure 
and I'm so grounded that I can take care of myself and my offspring. So, which part seeks the pleasure? The id. And then the other part? Ego. That's what? Um, so the id wants the, the ego to provide for it. And so the ego helps to keep the id in contact. So that you may see something that you want and say, I want this, I want this. But the ego said, but you can't get this because if you get this, this and that, you will happen. So the ego can check the it. Yes, keep it in, keep the it in, in check. It's very, very important the um, instant gratification versus the delayed gratification. That's important too. And that's what you're talking about with the it, right? And the delayed gratification. Yes, and the thing about it too is that you have to decide what you want. And you know, you can't be just all pleasure. And so the ego keeps you in check make sure that you stay on track. And the aid that we're born with, the aid is present at birth. Right. Seeking to be satisfied. Right. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to decide what you want out of life. Well, I definitely got my psychology roots from you. Data and Sessions into psychology. Psychology doesn't pay. <laughs> yeah, understanding why we do what we do and trying to, you have to use your intelligence, right? Even if you don't know the terminology, you feel a part of yourself trying to get the gratification and your intelligence says, when I go down that road, this is the outcome and that's not the outcome I want. I want a better outcome, so I need to delay that and go this way. So we're all, have, we're all using psychology whether or not you know the terminology. Right, so, so there are many things I put in my unconscious because they are painful. Losing your mother at six, so you, so I repressed that memory. And growing up without a father, um, that was also repressed in my um, unconscious. You have the conscious, the pre-conscious, and the unconscious, and so many things you you suppress. And you say, okay, I'm going to go forward. I think, and make I think that's one of, the, one of the strengths that Af Blacks and African Americans use is that you have to suppress your trauma, not focus on it because it can distract you and just really zoom in to hold on to the dream and stay right. So you need to be in a conscious or a pre-conscious. Right. But at the same time, you know, it can be said that you're not in touch with your feelings or not expressing uh, your well let's look at it this way when you have things in your unconscious it's things that are painful and you don't want to remember so we're in america everybody goes to psychiatrists in jamaica it's not the norm right so what what happens is that you develop defense mechanism to keep you survival to, to keep you so that I did that. So I suppressed it, suppressed those traumatic experiences I had during my early, early, early years living in Portland where my mom died and then the hair you stole from my grandmother or my father was shipped away to Port to St. Thomas and from St. Thomas to England so that he didn't bear any responsibility was traumatic, so what I did, I suppressed it. And then I decided I'm going to go forward. And I'm very happy for my um, existence right now, which is mostly because of God and my grandmother and my aunt, especially the one who died in 2019. Okay. Well, thank you, Mom, so much. It's been great, you know, we really touched on a lot of bases and just wanted to give a, a, a feeling of, you know, where I get it from and those kinds of things. Well, I hope that listening to me and using your experience, you'll continue to raise your boys so that their experience will not be traumatic as much as if less, it, it, you know, you can't control one's experience because living in America and you're black 
and you're a man, there's so many things can happen. But if you do your part, well then even those things that may happen, they'll be able to weather, yeah. weather the storm. Yes. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you for joining me today. And uh, I'm having a great time, and I keep saying that this moment on the trip is very um, meaningful. Yes, it is. It's a lovely place where I had a lovely experience. Yeah. And, okay, thank and, you for having me. But just to close on this, you know, your sister that you grew up with, saying, Mom, you know, we haven't had a lot of moments like this. So this moment is, to me, it's like the full circle. Aunt, Aunt P, Auntie Mordina, she left Jamaica very, very early. So you and her have been <laughs> separated for a long, long time. And even you moving to America now, we, it's very rare that we have five, six days together uninterrupted. Yeah, this yeah. is the first time that has ever happened. Yes. In the last 30 years. Great. So, so that's good. This is, a, this is the beginning of a new chapter. I hope so. Yes. Thank you so much, Mom. You're welcome. We squeezed it in.